session is sponsored by CARP. Um, CARP is an advocacy that looks after the interests of Canadians as they age, and naturally enough has an interest in longevity, which I spike by adding an interest in radical life extension. So we've heard from Dr. Greger about the secret drug that can lead to longevity. Our next speaker, even though he calls sleep a pastime, asserts that the benefits of rest and sleep to health and well-being is as important as diet and exercise. So we all kind of intuit it, we know it, and yet to sleep deeply and to sleep unawares and to sleep productively is too often a rare occurrence in many people's lives. So Richard L. Horner will unpack for us the mysteries of sleep. Thank you. Let's begin by asking ourselves a question. Let's think of a question before the slide advances, <laughs> which is not. Is there a spare clicker? It's not working. What is the most complex known machine in the universe? You might say, well, why haven't I thought about just planet Earth? Well, some of the machines we may think about may have left Earth. Some are leaving our solar system. A good candidate is the Large Hadron Collider, 27 kilometers long, hundreds of millions of parts. So complicated, it blew up soon after it was installed. When it was fixed, though, it led to some of the greatest scientific discoveries of our recent time about the structure of our own universe. All that said, this machine does what it's told. AlphaGo, the product of Google DeepMind, thinks by itself. And this year, it beat the Grand Master at what is considered to be the most complicated game in existence. And this was watched by hundreds of millions of people, and it was a very big deal. Another candidate are these two. Well, these are my kids, and I find them the most complicated things that I know. <laughs> but I think they're representative, perhaps, but not them individually, but something they have, I have, and we all have. And that is a brain. It has 100 billion neurons. 100 trillion connections which change each and every day. And if there is, and probably in high likelihood, there is other intelligent life in our universe, it's more than likely they'll have one of these too. But brains do curious things. Brains shut themselves off from the outside world each and every day for hours on end. Why? And we're not alone. Sleep exists in us and all living things that move around. And animals find curious ways to achieve this. Sleep, uh, whales and dolphins live permanently in oceans, and they sleep with half their brain at a time, and then they switch over. Some animals have flexible half-brain sleep. Sea lions, for example, when they're in the ocean for weeks on end, sleep with half their brain at a time, and then when they come on land, they sleep just like we do, with their whole brain at once. Birds, like mallard ducks, when they sleep in groups to avoid predators, the ones in the middle sleep with full brain sleep, the ones on the edges have one eye open. And then when they've had enough, they move into the middle and they swap. Animals that live in predaceous environments, like the savannas of Africa, sleep very lightly and don't sleep very long, and they sleep in groups, much as our human ancestors did. The animals that kill them sleep lots. 
We don't often realize, but sleep exists in less complex organisms, despite the fact we shouldn't forget either that some of these organisms have actually complex societies, like flies, ants, and bees. Sleep exists, we appreciate in ourselves that babies sleep lots, we sleep less as adults and aged adults. Did you realize that babies sleep in the womb? Babies born prematurely and kept alive at 26 weeks exist in a permanent state that resembles sleep. And then over the subsequent days, they wake up. Same is true of other animals. Sleep more when they're young, less when they're older. Sleep's a curious thing. It seems to be a solution to the game of life when other solutions are biologically possible. But why? Take home point, sleep is not a mystery, and it's a nonsense to perpetuate this myth that you'll read about, you'll hear about often. Sleep, lots of things happen when we sleep. Well, that's good physiological sense. We spend eight hours doing it, so it's a good time for our bodies to do lots of things. That's not answering the question. Why does sleep exist in the first place in us and other living things? And it serves a very simple, very powerful and very elegant function in everything, including us. All these living things have one thing in common, despite their huge variety in the panoply of life. They all have brains. And brains have universal properties. They are built to be rewired and flexible, highly interconnected, and they do something very special in biology, which I'll explain. They are the vehicle to navigate the thing they inhabit across the fitness landscape. So let's unpack this idea and see it in action. Animals, by dint of their own clever activities in the world, hasten or guide in the further evolution of species. So says the philosopher and neuroscientist Daniel Dennett. This crow has never done this before. It's never done this in nature. Likewise, never will. It's trying to get some food out of a hard-to-access a hard tube. This crow is a synanthropic, which means they live around humans. They watch, they learn, they're highly intelligent, and they sleep on what they watch. And they can do very clever things. So what is the fitness landscape? Let's look at a familiar picture. It's the Himalayan mountains, Mount Everest. We normally think of the top as being the death zone. But in this case, let's flip that. The top is the life zone. We can think living things live in a fitness landscape. And let's, for example, for purposes of simplicity, let's look at the x and y axis here that we have genes for doing a good trick and learning a good trick, like that crow did. And you, individuals and species want to be high up on that mountain range. And by virtue of our genes, we could be in a low position in which there's a high probability of death and extinction for individuals and species, or we could be high up on that mountain range in which there's a higher probability for reproductive and species success and progress. The position of our genes just places us on that map. And by itself, it's not enough. Nature has found a very, very, very clever way of working with this. Instead, instead of having genes predict our brain rewiring, they allow it to rewire itself. And by doing so, individuals and species now can ascend Mount Fitness, cross and go up the other side of Death Valley, all in their own lifespan. How powerful is this? Adaptable brains help clown mount fitness, which we'll explain why, and sleep helps the process by providing a major boost. We are the product of our genes, given to us by our parents, for better or for worse. Genes can only do so much in predicting an environment based on the history of species. But living things, when they're born, behave. 
Everything behaves to varying degrees, and behavior causes experience. If we put the sound up, you can hear the activity of brain cells from this particular brain, individual cells firing as this living thing walks across a track. This is the brain's way of registering experience, and this is just one example. The identification of the brain's spatial navigation system by Moser, Moser, and O'Keefe was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2014. We all have one of these. We think we have five senses, we've got seven. Space and time are the extra two. So we're listening to multiple cells, they're all color-coded, and they all indicate position. Our brain's experience from when we're born onwards leads to brain rewiring, which is defined as changing the number and the strengths of the connections in our brain. That allows something that's so powerful in biology is called a flexible phenotype. And I've tried to indicate what that means. It allows organisms to change their position or fit of fitness within their own lifespan. Flexible phenotype and variation in biology is the founding principle of biological uh, organization. It's so powerful that natural selection strongly selects for this. And because organisms that survive and pro progress through eons of time, we all have this capacity, and it gets written into our genes. This cycle works for every living thing, including us. And let's unpack this now a little bit for humans. We are born with roughly the same number of, death of brain cells that we have now, give or take a few. I think that's amazing that we all have the same number of brain cells that we were born with, but none of the babies in the current hospitals are ever going to come here and listen to what we're talking about. Our brains, or let alone understand, so our brains have changed enormously. We have built in our lives a hundred trillion connections from that fixed circuit board. I think the battery's dying. There you go. <laughs> we have 100 trillion connections, but we, we only have 30,000 genes. Let's do the math. That's one gene for every three and a third billion connections. It's simply not possible for our genes to build our brains in our lifespan. So nature has found an incredible solution for this. It's just said, OK, let's, let's get rid of that idea. All we have to do is to build the ability to rewire. And once you have that, life can take off. And sleep boosts the process. When we're awake, we have experience. You saw and you heard it. Those brain cells indicate in position, for example. In sleep, that process is replayed. So every day, we have an inner circle which works much, much, much faster than the genes, which is, takes, uh, takes a, a generation every time. It's a very, very slow cycle. Brain rewiring happens every single day, over and over again. And the beauty of sleep is that replay, which we can sometimes perceive as dreaming or mental activity, happens over and over again. The same information is repeated over and over again, more times than it was experienced, and much, much, much faster. And that rewires the brain extremely efficiently. So what does it mean for human potential? And in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to give you two examples. Since our brains build themselves over our lifespan based on our experiences, for better or for worse. Experiences build our brains 
and that optimally happens in sleep. Everything about what we are, it's not just memory, everything about what we are. And sleep optimizes the process, and it's optimal if we prioritize sleep and sleep well. The second thing which I'm going to leave you with is creativity. Since intelligence, as measured by the IQ, has been measured, it's been rising, certainly in conceptual capabilities. And as every indication, it will continue to rise. What's powering this? I will argue that it's our creativity is powering our increasing creativity and intelligence. So let's step back for a moment. What's the evidence for this? Well, the Earth was formed 4.5 billion years ago. That's, that's a really long time. Really hard to get a, gra a grasp on what this really means. So let's just put it into perspective that we can maybe understand. 24 hours. 1.8 million years ago, walking humans emerged. Now that's 35 seconds on this 24-hour scale. Thinking humans, three seconds ago, 180,000 years. Now, 50,000 years ago, there was the so-called Great Leap Forward that Jared Diamond has written about in Guns, Germs, and Steel. That's less than one second ago when there was the emergence of art, culture, music, literature, science, you name it. And since then, we've seen the evolution of lots of things, ideas, knowledge, and it's just been staggering. 210 years ago, the Industrial Revolution happened, which is five milliseconds ago. And the progress since then has just been exponential. The technological progress is outstanding, it's continuing to rise, and it's exponential. We see it in our kids, triple screening, anybody who's a parent, this is the norm these days, all the while performing advanced calculus. <laughs> our brains of our children are different. So what does it mean to us? Well, we live now in a pool of readily accessible knowledge, ideas, we're getting them today, inventions and technologies from all over the world. The pool of this knowledge is expanding and it's relentless. The pipeline into our brain, though, is constrained in time. In our day life, we sample, teach, and interact with this pool of knowledge, ideas, inventions, and technology. But in our nightlife, the brain rewiring optimizes our cognition, our creativity and insight, and then something wonderful happens. We put knowledge back into that expanding pool for access by ourselves and others. Our creativity is enhancing our creativity. We access ideas, we access technologies, we all have it, some of us are on it. Our experiences with those ideas and technology is changing our brains each and every day. And sleep is boosting the process, so the very next day, we can have greater ideas, greater insight, and invent greater technology. So let's give ourselves something very precious, and that is to value sleep and what it's providing. Thank you. Richard, I think everybody in the audience values sleep the mystery for many people and the practical question I want to ask you is, is there an optimum amount of sleep? Is there a certain number of hours that adults should seek to sleep? And how do you get to sleep if you can't? I think there's, there's the, the easy answer to that is to the prescriptive element is can be helpful but damaging. So the, the idea that we all need seven to eight hours is typical on average, but it's like saying we all wear a size seven to eight shoe. We all should get enough to feel on top of our game, I would say. The, the easy tips for achieving sleep is to regularize our schedules, don't catastrophize, 
and prioritize. And uh, there's a lot of influences on sleep, particularly external light, so that's putting us like on a different time zone to the, say Toronto. But really, it's, it's like good nutrition, which we heard about. The knowledge is there. We know certainly about nutrition and activity and how much exercise we should get. Well, we should include sleep on the list. It's not an easy prescription, but valuing it, I think, is the first step for everybody in uh, incorporating our sleep life as much as our wake life. How many hours do you sleep a night? Well, I'm probably the same as most people at my age. I, I, I prioritize sleep. My kids laugh at me when I'm usually the first off to bed. So uh, I'm, I'm, I aim for eight, at least eight hours. And I don't mind waking up in the middle of the night because it's completely normal. And there's no need for drugs to promote sleep because they really don't improve sleep. They alter brain rewiring. And uh, it's, it's easy to get sleep by just having good habits without having becoming dependent on sleep aids. There. <laughs> Thank you so much.